Police officers are sworn to protect the public from crime. But what happens when cops become criminals themselves? What sorts of horrifying crimes do they commit? And will they face justice in the end? Let's take a look. If you're interested in this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Number 1. Dennis Perkins Perkins was a former Louisiana police officer. In August 2017, Perkins was arrested and convicted of forcing himself on children. The worst part is, he didn't do it once or twice, which would be bad enough. Perkins was hit with 60 counts of these charges. These crimes were revealed when one of his former victims talked about his actions to their school counselor. The school counselor then reported Perkins to law enforcement. At the trial, many of his victims testified against him. There was also evidence presented, including disgusting text messages and photos taken from his phone. But despite all the evidence presented in court, Perkins continually denied that he was guilty. The allegations were part of a conspiracy against me. The victims have been coached to lie. The judge and jury were not convinced, of course. After discussing the case, they placed a very harsh sentence on Perkins, 100 years in prison with no possibility of release. After all, Perkins' case was a significant one, attracting national attention and scrutiny. Further investigation revealed that he had previously been employed by multiple law agencies across America, despite a string of accusations and complaints filed against him. This includes the Livingston Parish Sheriff's Office, the Baton Rouge Police Department, and the Louisiana Attorney General's Office. How was he allowed to continue despite these accusations? Nobody knows for sure, but it led to widespread criticism from the public. Shortly after his trial began, his wife, Cynthia Perkins, was also arrested, intimidating one of her husband's victims and bribing them to withdraw their testimony. She pleaded guilty to this and was sentenced to 41 years in prison. Number 2. Michael Valva Valva was a New York City cop convicted of two ND degree murder. And not just any murder, but the death of his son, Thomas Valva. For killing his son, he received a sentence of 40 years to life in prison. The story began on January 17, 2020. Michael was at home with his sons at the time when he called emergency services to report that Thomas had fallen and was not breathing. The ambulance rushed Thomas to the hospital, but unfortunately he was pronounced dead there. A standard autopsy was performed, which revealed something disturbing. It wasn't the fall or being unable to breathe that killed Thomas. Instead, he died of hypothermia. Because of this, Thomas's death was ruled a homicide. The investigation uncovered horrific abuse by Michael and his fiancée Angelina Polina against Michael's sons. Thomas and his older brother Anthony had been forced to sleep in an unheated garage, where temperatures were as low as minus 17 degrees Celsius. This was supposedly a punishment for them wetting the bed. Michael had a history of mistreating his kids. His ex-wife Justina had made multiple reports against him to Child Protection Services. But despite these reports, Michael was able to retain custody of their kids. In court, more evidence was presented that strengthened the case against Michael Valva. This includes audio recordings of Valva and Angelina mocking Thomas as he was dying. In the recordings, Valva said he didn't care if Thomas lived or died. Ultimately, the court found him guilty on March 25, 2021. His crimes were two end degree murder and endangering the welfare of a child. Angelina received the same sentence. Valva's actions sparked a lot of anger across his community. This case also led to numerous calls for reform in CPS and better child protection measures. Number 3. Daniel Holtzclaw Holtzclaw, an Oklahoma City police officer, was convicted of misusing his authority on duty, especially around female suspects. This occurred during a period of seven months. While patrolling a low-income neighborhood, Holtzclaw targeted vulnerable women. This includes women with criminal histories and standing warrants of arrest. He picked these women because they would be less likely to report his actions. Using his authority and the threat of arrest, Holtzclaw was able to coerce his victims into inappropriate acts. His crimes came to light when a woman reported his conduct at a traffic stop. The subsequent investigation uncovered Holtzclaw's consistent pattern of bad behavior. Following the first woman's testimony, 13 other women also came forward to report their stories. Each described similar experiences of being manipulated by him. Holtzclaw had misused body searches and pat-downs as a means of harassing them. Aside from that, Holtzclaw also made suggestive comments to women he was apprehending and demanded favors in exchange for leniency. But Holtzclaw was unrepentant. Even after the women testified against him in court, he insisted he wasn't guilty. Instead, he pinned the blame on the women, saying their evidence was fake and that they were working together against him. Regardless, the court still found him guilty. 
he was sentenced to 263 years in prison. Following his sentence, Holtzclaw was visibly upset during the sentencing and began to cry. But judging by the trauma he put his victims through, his punishment was only fair. The women were already vulnerable. Struggling with poverty, addiction, and mental health issues, Holtzclaw's crimes made them suffer even more. Number 4. Wayne Jenkins Wayne Jenkins was a former police officer and leader of the Gun Trace Task Force, GTTF, in Baltimore, Maryland. This unit was formed to investigate violent crimes and illegal firearms trafficking, but unfortunately they became corrupt and started committing the same crimes they were supposed to stop. For over 10 years, Jenkins served as a police officer, but his career ended when he was implicated in a wide-ranging corruption scandal, along with other members of his task force. The investigation began in 2015, when the FBI received an anonymous tip that the GTTF members were acting improperly. These members were robbing people while on duty. Needless to say, the FBI launched an investigation. Jenkins and his team had been engaging in numerous illegal activities throughout their stint in the task force. This includes extortion, theft, drug dealing, and planting evidence. Jenkins used his position to orchestrate many of these activities. They would often take the money and drugs for themselves instead of turning the evidence in. Then the task force would sell those same drugs on the street, continuing the cycle of drug abuse. They also planted evidence on suspects to obtain false convictions. The FBI launched a sting operation of its own to catch them in the act. It set up an informant posing as a drug dealer. When Jenkins and his team tried to rob him, they were arrested. The investigation into corruption in Baltimore's police department was extensive. It exposed deep roots of corrupt behavior, as well as many flaws in the department's monitoring systems. In 2017, Jenkins pleaded guilty to several charges, including racketeering, robbery, and filing false reports. The judge sentenced him to 25 years in federal prison without the possibility of parole. This case also forced many other police departments to confront their lack of accountability and expose the need for oversight to prevent corruption. Number 5. Braulio Gonzalez Braulio Gonzalez is a former officer from the Miami-Dade Police Department. Like Dennis Perkins, he also committed horrific crimes against children. Between 2011 to 2013, Gonzalez threatened two young girls with harm if they didn't comply with his demands. One of the victims was his family member. This went on for two years, only stopping when the victim turned 10. According to the victim's testimony, the first time it happened, Gonzalez woke her up and pointed his gun at her. He said he would kill her sibling sleeping in the same room if she didn't follow him. When the girl complied, he led her to his room. There, he forced himself onto her until he was satisfied. Gonzalez then let the girl go after making her promise to keep quiet about the whole thing. But it wasn't the last time. The same events happened a few times. Each time, Gonzalez committed this crime without fear of being discovered. The trauma was so great that this victim only managed to tell her psychologist about it in 2018, five years after the abuse stopped. Her psychologist immediately reported Gonzalez's crime to the authorities, leading to his arrest soon after. He was put on house arrest while awaiting trial, but in a baffling turn of events, the police department continued paying him his salary even after his arrest. After nine months of house arrest, another of Gonzalez's victims came forward to report similar treatment. Despite all this, Gonzalez insisted that he was innocent, even as he was sentenced to life in prison. One of the victims told Gonzalez, I will forever have this scar that you imprinted on me. Till today, Gonzalez is still appealing the verdict but shows no sign of feeling guilty. Even throughout the trial, he has continued being violent. Three of his ex-girlfriends reported recently that he hit them. All three of them complained about Gonzalez threatening them with his gun. Number 6. Zachary Wester Once, Wester was a sheriff's deputy in Jacksonville, Florida, but he lost his position when the court convicted him of planting evidence and stealing money from suspects. The investigation into him began in 2018 when Jackson County's counsel noticed something unusual about his record. The prosecutor contacted the Florida Department of Law Enforcement to investigate Wester's behavior. As the investigation went on, more and more of his actions were exposed. It was clear that Wester had been misusing his power for years. The FDLE report states that Wester would conduct illegal searches of vehicles during traffic stops. He would then plant drugs or other illegal substances on motorists as an excuse to falsely arrest these motorists. In some cases, Wester also stole money from them. The investigation revealed at least 12 cases of Wester abusing his power. In one case, Wester's body camera captured him planting a bag of illegal substances in a woman's car. In another instance, he arrested a man on drug charges after finding a syringe in the man's truck. 
even though the syringe was later found to contain no drugs. Following the release of the investigation report, Wester was fired from his position as a deputy sheriff in 2019. In 2020, he was arrested and charged with numerous crimes. His list of offenses includes racketeering, official misconduct, fabricating evidence, false imprisonment, and drug possession. Wester also received a charge of perjury for an unrelated case where he lied under oath in court. Wester was eventually found guilty of 19 of the 67 charges against him and sentenced to 12 years in prison for his crimes. He was also ordered by the judge to pay back his victims what he had stolen from them. The case of Wester highlights the potential dangers of individuals in positions of authority being given too much power. Wester was trusted as a police officer and had the responsibility to protect and serve the community. But instead of doing so, he abused his position to commit crimes. Wesker's actions were devastating for the individuals he wronged. Many of them were falsely fined or jailed, losing time as well as potential income. But more than that, Wesker also harmed the community and the reputation of law enforcement as a whole. Number 7. Michael Dotro. Dotro was a police officer in the township of Edison, New Jersey. He was eventually stripped of his rank after being found guilty of multiple crimes. This includes arson, misusing police resources, and stalking. Looking back at Dotro's history, he showed a clear pattern of instability and reckless behavior. In 2013, Dotro set fire to the home of a superior officer following a disagreement. The officer's family, including his two children, were inside the home at the time. Fortunately, Dotro's actions did not harm anyone. Dotro also attempted to burn down the home of another police officer who he saw as a rival. He was also charged with misuse of police databases while facing an unrelated lawsuit against him. Dotro accessed restricted information about the individuals involved in the lawsuit. Dotro also stalked his former girlfriend, making false police reports about her and continually harassing and intimidating her. He even installed a tracking device on her car. Dotro was charged with stalking, falsifying a police report and computer theft. In 2017, Dotro pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit official misconduct and one count of arson. In exchange for his plea, the remaining charges were dropped against him. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison and is not eligible for parole until he serves at least 17 years. Number 8. Kenneth Blue. His crime is one of the more shocking crimes on this list. Killing a pregnant woman in cold blood, following a trial that shocked his community, Blue was charged with the death of Jennifer Webb. Webb was 32 and pregnant with Blue's baby. But there was one small problem for Blue. He was already married to someone else. If news got out about his affair, he would have been in trouble. So Blue decided to get rid of Webb. Blue arranged to meet Webb in a secluded area to discuss child support. Webb agreed, not thinking there was anything suspicious about his offer. When she got there, Blue drew his gun and shot her, leaving her to die as he fled. Passing motorists found her body and called 911, but it was too late. Webb was dead. An investigation was conducted soon after. Blue had been careless, and the tire tracks and bullet casings left behind linked him to the crime scene. An inmate who'd shared a cell with Blue also came forward stating that Blue confessed to his crime. At the trial, the prosecution presented a lot of evidence, including the parentage of Webb's child. Blue's defense argued that he was mentally unstable when he killed Webb and could not be held accountable for his actions. But in the end, the judge ruled him guilty. His sentence was life in prison without parole. It was hoped that this would ease the minds of Webb's loved ones after their tragic loss. Webb's death severely affected her family and community. It also sent shockwaves across the community and nation. As a result, many began to call for increased monitoring and mental health support for officers who exhibit signs of mental instability. Number 9. David Carrick. A former Metropolitan Police Officer in London, David Carrick was a cruel and corrupt man who finally faced justice. Carrick was an ex-soldier before joining the police. He had a short stint in the British Army and then joined London's Metropolitan Police in 2001 and was part of the Parliamentary and Diplomatic Protection Team from 2009 onwards. In 2002, his romantic partner claimed he had attacked her, but despite multiple complaints, he was recertified to remain an armed police officer. Due to Carrick's penchant for cruelty on the job, his colleagues often gave him a variety of unsavory nicknames. Between 2003 and 2020, Carrick used dating apps like Badoo and Tinder to meet multiple women. He would first gain their trust using his job as a cop, 
Before mistreating and harming these women, Carrick often degraded his victims as well, locking them up in small spaces. Another woman reported that Carrick had attacked her a year earlier. She was initially reluctant to come forward, but finally decided to do so following the kidnapping and death of Sarah Everard, who was killed by another Metropolitan Police officer named Wayne Cousins. After this woman's testimony came out, Carrick was arrested and suspended from police work. He initially pleaded not guilty to all charges against him, but soon Carrick would sing a different tune. At the Old Bailey Criminal Court in central London, he pleaded guilty to 49 charges, including 24 charges involving 12 female victims. Carrick's conviction led to the Metropolitan Police re-examining past reports of offenses committed by its officers and staff. On the 6th of February, 2023, Carrick's sentencing began at Southwark Crown Court. He received 36 life sentences with a minimum term of 30 years, plus 239 days on the 7th of February, 2023. He'll become eligible for parole on the 2nd of May, 2052. Last of all, at number 10, Wayne Cousins. Wayne Cousins was another former Metropolitan Police officer who worked for the force for nearly a decade. He also served with the Parliamentary and Diplomatic Protection Command at the time of his arrest, which was the same unit where David Carrick worked. In March 2021, Cousins was convicted of involvement in the death of Sarah Everard. She didn't even know him, but unfortunately became the victim of his unrestrained desire. Everard was walking home from a friend's house in South London in the evening when Cousins pulled up in his car beside her. He abducted her, and her body was later found in a wooded area in Kent. When the news of Everard's disappearance broke, it sparked widespread outrage and protests over the issue of violence against women in the UK. Cousins was arrested shortly after. His trial took place in September and October 2021. Prosecutors presented the court with evidence, detailing how Cousins used his police training and resources to kidnap, assault, and murder Everard. The case was airtight. There was no way he could wiggle his way out of a jail sentence. So in September 2021, Cousins pleaded guilty to all three charges against him. He was sentenced to a whole life term in prison. The judge described his crimes as a betrayal of trust that the public places in police officers and said he had shown no remorse for his actions. Following Cousins' trial, a debate was sparked about the treatment of women in the UK. Throughout this period, the Metropolitan Police were met with harsh criticism. At a rally to remember Everard, they responded with excessive use of force. Many have also criticized them for their failure to properly investigate misconduct by their officers. The UK government announced a series of actions aimed at tackling violent crimes against women. One was to establish a police watchdog to investigate police misconduct. Secondly, they would appoint a new victims commissioner to support crime victims. The government also drafted a new law, the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. This law was to allow for stricter sentences against crimes against women and new measures to protect domestic abuse victims. It's safe to say that while the ideal image of a police officer is that of a protector and law enforcer, the reality is often less rosy. Many officers fall into crime themselves, but regardless of whether a police officer is taking bribes, committing murder, or falsely arresting people, a crime is a crime no matter how small or big. There certainly needs to be better systems in place to monitor and hold the police accountable for their deeds. This applies not just to America or the UK, but all around the world. After all, even the watchmen need watching if they are to remain honest and upright. If the police are corrupt, the community will be even more so. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you thought in the comments down below and don't forget to subscribe. In this day and age, qualified immunity remains one of the deadliest threats to US citizens. There is no doubt, and as witnessed daily, that as long as police officers in our uncivilized nation are encouraged to murder without consequences, we can expect no improvements to our life expectancy. According to the United States National Academy of Sciences, and I quote, police in the United States kill far more people than do police in other advanced industrial democracies. To date, Colorado, New Mexico and New York have repealed qualified immunity and we remain hopeful that in the near future, serial killers with badges will be held accountable for the unreasonable execution of citizens. Furthermore, the Academy of Sciences additionally says, journalists have stepped into this void and initiated a series of systematic efforts to track police involved killings. And I bid to you, my fellow citizens, that this rampage of certified murders must be stopped for the safety of our children, 
handicapped, and veterans. Please support the new Institute for Justice and their Americans Against Qualified Immunity campaign. Check them out at www.aaqi.com. You'll also find them on Facebook and Twitter. That's Americans Against Qualified Immunity. That's all for now, my brothers and sisters. Stay safe and always film the police.